Welcome to Meditation and Aliens with Doro and Matt, a webcast that explores everything we currently know about the truth about aliens, human history, reality, consciousness, and the role meditation can do to help us understand all these things, and how we might all work together to build the best world possible for all beings, human or non-human alike. Meditation and Aliens is hosted by me, Matt Reddy. I'm an amateur ufologist. I have a degree in philosophy. I'm the creator of HiveOne.net. I'm also an elected public hospital commissioner in Jefferson County, Washington. Each week, I am joined by Doro Kiley, longtime meditator, meditation teacher, and an experiencer with many stories, and life coach extraordinaire. You can find more about Doro at her website, creationcoach.com. Now, on to the show. And we're back again. How are you doing, Doro? I'm doing great. Beautiful day out here in Virginia in the mountains. Absolutely gorgeous. I'm planting my garden. So, nice. yeah, beautiful. Nice. Yeah, watching the world go crazy out there. I mean, I'm <laughs> I'm watching the uh, this whole thing in the in the Middle East. You know how how it's tied into the um, Jewish religion. You know that. There's a lot of threats going on. I found out one thing that was interesting was that Hamas, they're saying that they bombed back whenever it was, uh, you know, all those those kids and everything, because they saw that the Jews were bringing in red heifers. And I thought, what, what does that have to do with anything? And it turns out it's biblical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They say when the when the heifers are sacrificed on the on the mount, you know, the temple mount, that that will be heralding in the uh, the the new uh, you know savior. Um, so yeah, ten, tensions are building over there because if that happens, the problem is the temple mount is. Um, now it has a uh, um, a mosque on top of it, a Muslim mosque. Yeah. So you know it, it's it's really asking for trouble if they do that. So, yeah, I'm I'm a little tense, I think, about all that. But aside from that, I'm just uh, planting potatoes. How about you? <laughs> well, yeah, I um, I'm doing good, doing good. I I actually been researching a little bit that the red heifer uh prophecy as well mm -hmm. um and I, I watched a good video that sort of summarized uh the details of how it relates to christianity judaism islam and yeah it's really interesting they they went to a lot of trouble to get five red heifers that met all the criteria they actually imported them from the united states oh, boy. Um, yeah. so like a, they had a you know they found a rancher that had five. I mean, it has to have like perfectly red hair. Can't have any non-red hair, and wow, be past a certain age. So they, yeah, they, and so, so anyway, they um, and they built an altar, a sacrifice altar, right next to the Temple Mount, oh. uh, so they could do this. And the, um, and the timeline is that apparently they're going to do it anytime between now and Passover, which I think is on the 22nd. Yeah. Of, April, of April right? Yeah. April 22nd. Yeah. And they, and after, and the, the, the Jewish prophecy is that if they, once they do that, then the temple can be rebuilt and the Messiah can come. Uh, and it's interesting but yeah. I mean, do they have to? I mean, what's going to happen to the uh, Muslim mosque that's there? Because that's pretty yeah. important for, for them. Is that? Yeah. Oh, it's dear. part of the controversy that uh, in the video, they were like, you know, it's not completely impossible that they could build the temple on there and leave the mosque also. But it just sounds like all parties are opposed to that. Uh, they. They don't, uh, neither side wants that. So it, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if Israel, the government of Israel is just looking for an excuse to uh, take out that mosque and just claim the Temple Mount for themselves. It seems 
seems in line with what Israel government of Israel is doing these days for just yeah. figuring out a way to take what it wants. Well, I guess we'll know by by April 22nd, right? Right, right. And some are saying they might time it with the eclipse in some way. Oh, that's the 8th. Oh, that's just what next week when is yeah. that? It's coming up. Yeah. And it was interesting the uh it said that in Christianity that uh Jesus claimed in some of the things he said to be the uh the red heifer himself and the sacrifice of him was the final uh because it's like there's supposed to be like nine red heifer sacrifices and this would be the ninth one but and there anyways it's sort of confusing but it says that jesus was the ninth one and he sacrificed himself and he was the messiah but of course judaism doesn't believe jesus was the messiah so they're still waiting for a messiah and uh yeah boy we live in interesting times don't we yes yes so i mean it will be very interesting if if they do this sacrifice and and aliens show up and one of them claims to be jesus coming back that would be be very interesting yeah well that was my <laughs> next question how does this all tie in to this you know disclosure and uh extraterrestrial influence uh, oh boy i guess we yeah. might find out finally after all these couple thousand years and <laughs> right <laughs> oh, anyways deep our, breath our deep religious. deep breath <laughs> <laughs> what's going all on right. And my other question is, I, I suppose you had your class this week, right? Yeah. Yes, so, I did. This is this good? yeah, it was great. This is the second course. Um, and the this class was a focus on how will technology, science, uh, and economics be impacted it by the revelation of non-human intelligence? What would be the impact on technology science? Um and uh, and I, maybe it wasn't a focus on economics, mainly technology and science. Yeah. That's and good. Um, yeah. So in in a nutshell, you know, it's basically it it seems, of course, that aliens are real in some sort of aliens, non human intelligence, mm -hmm. um, and the technology that it seems clear they have one is anti gravity of some sort. They seem to clearly have the ability to move ships pretty much however they want, regardless of wind, and probably can lift whatever weight they want, which would help explain how these giant megaliths, you know, moved hundreds of tons of stone, seemingly extremely long distances, probably had a little help with technology we don't know about. Yeah. So this, uh, so there'd be transportation technology. Um, but more important than that, uh, Danny was saying is the energy technology they use. They, they, seem to there's tons of evidence that they have some sort of energy source that is like and basically like an infinite energy source they um, call that the zero point did he talk about that the zero point energy? He, i mean i've heard that it called that um yeah. yeah there and then uh so and actually so he went into this was really interesting he said that what was it he said it was during uh, george w bush uh his time and maybe during clinton's time too that they they both held these sessions to when they brought a bunch of experts in and they discussed whether or not to release any information about non-human in intelligence. Yeah. George W. Bush brought in Hal put off and a bunch of experts and they were trying to, and they broke up into small groups to say, okay, what would be the positive and negative effect if we told the world that these non-human intelligences existed? And then all the groups came back and said the negative impacts would be huge. Don't do it. Really? Yeah. And but the negative impacts they said were basically they were all economic impacts, and it was basically yeah. because it would make the rich people on Earth poor, more, uh, less rich. Um, <laughs> yeah. This is really self-interested negative impact. They said it would destabilize the stock market, it would undermine global currencies in the U.S. dollar, and it would completely undermine the fossil fuel industry because it would eliminate the whole fossil fuel industry, replacing it with this NHI energy. And so, and because like the U S dollar and currency is, is like the petrodollar, it's based on uh, the fossil fuel industry. It would destabilize the U S dollar. And so they're like, yeah, don't do it. It would make too, too much, cause too much trouble for the rich people on earth. So they're like, don't do it. Wow. 
Isn't that frustrating? I mean, yes. how can, <laughs> yeah. you know, they, that they call the shots and, you know, cause they want to keep their secrets. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It said, and it said in, uh, in 1992, when Clinton was president, they did another sort of discussion and he said that Jacques Vallée was there and he asked a, uh, one of the science advisors for Clinton, why is there so much pushback against telling the world about non-human intelligence? And the science advisor said, um, here, let's go outside and I'll talk to you. And they like, had to oh leave. Oh my, really? <laughs> yeah, he went outside and... Okay, he was hilarious. Danny was like, this is the story that the science advisor told him. He said, there once was an old man walking across a field and the old man came, saw a light on the ground and he looked down and it was a, a frog and it was sort of shining and the frog and he, he leaned down, he picked up the frog and the frog spoke to him <laughs> and the frog said, I am a beautiful princess. If you just kiss me, I've I will heard turn into before. a beautiful prince. Yeah, yeah, but wait. The, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If, if, if I, if you kiss me, I will turn into a beautiful princess and you and I will become the king and queen of all this land and we will live in wealth and happiness, um, you know, for a very, very long time. And the old man says to the frog, you know, I'm an old man. I kind of like my life the way it is. I think I'll just be happy with a talking frog. <laughs> yeah. Is that the story you had heard? That's it. No, no, no. This, no, I heard the original, you know, except it was a, a princess kissing an ugly old frog turning into a prince. Right, yeah. right. So, well, but so, yeah, there's a little twist on it. It's like he said, this is basically what's going on. It's the people in power that know about non-human intelligence. They have a limited, primitive limited primitive self-interest purposes that's what yeah it's they're comfortable thinking. yeah yeah they're just like uh no we're pretty happy just know being the ones that know about nhi every benefit from their technology and mm -hmm. we don't really need to live in a world where everyone knows and everyone <laughs> is empowered by this it's like oh my gosh so it, how do we break that i mean is that possible to break that is that what well, so continue i want to hear more about the class and where did that lead to? Yeah, well, I mean, it definitely says the, the whole purpose of the New Paradigm Institute is to try to prepare the world for being able to think, you know, think in with new worldviews. I mean, he says the, the problem is it, it breaks our entire worldview, the, the non-human intelligence. And it's like um, every time major there's been a major scientific revolution, you know, the world has had to adjust its thinking. And you know, we still basically have the thinking today that we live in this material world. It's a, a hyper material worldview. And he says the thinking that we have to adjust to is more like what quantum mechanics tells us, which is that at the most, when we look at the most fundamental level of reality and we break smash atoms and electrons and everything together, we see that at the base level, reality is uh is this weird potential energy that can like spontaneously turn into matter or energy and it's unpredictable except that we when we study how the human mind interacts with it we realize somehow human intention manipulates uh reality at the most fundamental level like you know if you shoot an electron at at two at a double slit it will randomly go between either slit if you're watching but if you have someone sitting there just mentally pushing the electron to go through the left slit there is a there is a st statistically significant effect you know the, yeah, the mind yeah. just affects it and right i've heard this yeah so in yeah. in essence you know we we are creating our reality see i believe that according to um, the, the sumerians and how humans were genetically manipulated 200,000 years ago I think part of that manipulation, um, they created the, the perfect worker species, but then, um, then we were given, okay, so this was Enki, Enki gave us this magical kundalini, which is represented as the, the serpent of, of uh, when it's awakened, it becomes 
wisdom and all knowing if if we develop it. So yeah, I, I feel like what what we're doing is we are finding out more about that, going back into the uh, deciphering the cuneiform tablets and trying to put the whole picture together. Um, so yeah, I don't know where I'm going with that, but uh, it, it's it's definitely more of a quantum issue, I think. So we got to tell a good story if we're developing our own storyline and creating our own reality. Wouldn't we just really have to have a clear kind of a universal picture for us to play with, to create. But right now it's just all going to chaos. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're not clear on what we're thinking and we're being manipulated energetically. That's what it feels like. Yeah. yeah. Well, so he sort of else? talked, he, he yeah. talked about that towards the end. Um, he, uh, he, he was saying, you know, that, that our human minds, you know, he was saying that the, what what we need to do is meditate. He actually was saying this. He was like, and he recommended, you know, 20 minutes of meditation in the morning, 20 minutes uh, at night before you go to bed. And he just yeah. recommended simple transcendental meditation, just a, and he said the, he, it's interesting how the angle in which he described it. He said the, the goal is just to start to um, recognize that so much of what goes on in our minds is, uh, is programmed is like yeah. these pre-programmed things. And if you, if you meditate and practice, you eventually start to um, start to be able to separate yourself from these pre-programmed instincts and behaviors and reactions and everything. And then, you know, he says you uh, achieve some level of free will. And, um, and he actually says they are going to have a, uh, courses they're going to start offering courses through ubiquity and the new paradigm institute on remote viewing and telepathy to develop um i mean he says that and you know in like uh, hindu traditions they actually teach that telepathy and uh, remote viewing and even teleportation and all sorts of things are actually possible if you uh properly train yourself and train your mind and, right um, and and even by location you know in in mm -hmm. india you hear stories of these uh great hint saints, you know, that they can actually appear in two places at once. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think we, we have a whole lot more capability than we have been programmed to believe. Yeah. It's interesting. And so it's, yeah, it's, uh, but anyways, that's sort of the, the general gist it's, uh, of the, he was saying, you know, it's been, been hidden because it's basically, they fear the the impact of revealing the science and the technology will dramatically impact the economies and throw off the current power balances on earth and people in power like the power balances yeah. on earth and yeah. so they're they uh are resistant to that and that uh you know it also that our minds um we need to figure out a whole new way of thinking of how we're going to understand reality understand our place in the universe yes uh, you know and i think once we are aware and you know and i mean like fully aware of our capabilities then we can actually intentionally choose which way to go without being led around by the nose which is how it seems like we're just being you know go this way no go this way you know and just agitated like shaking a jar of ants um, so yeah, I think meditation to, to pull back from all of that, but also how to begin, uh, uh, to kind of intentionally formulate a vision for what we do want intentionally and be more self-reliant, you know, to regain our sovereignty. Um, and I, and I've put this out uh, on the internet a few times that I have this idea that asking s some uh, artificial intelligence, chat GPT, to come up with a great idea to intermingle the ideas of Joanne Givers uh, on the four pillars of a decentralized society and sort of mix that up with the values of the Iroquois Confederacy, which was the model 
for Benjamin Franklin uh, when he was kind of coming up with the whole American Constitution idea. He he pretty much modeled it after the Iroquois Confederacy, um, minus women, of course, mm. uh, because in the Iroquois Confederacy, there was a lot of uh, women, you know, they had a certain power, the clan mothers and all that. So Chad GPT came up with an amazing much too long to to go over uh, sort of an idea of how how these things can work together, how to become technologically, um, you know, uh, decentralized, but work like kind of like Bitcoin, you know, blockchain and all that, how we can still use the technologies, but then introduce the more uh, native um, values uh, of honoring the earth and working together and, you know, barter and stuff like that. So I think it's important that we begin to visualize what we do want. What can we create as things are unraveling? Because it feels like everything is just unraveling. Yeah. Um, so if we're going to either, we're either going to unravel with it and just all die and, you know, go off to some other world and start again or something, or we can really be more intentional you know, and create something before it all falls apart. I don't know. That's my, that's my uh, thought. Yeah. What, what did, uh, what did the, um, what did Danny have to say about what, what could happen or did he not embellish too much on that? Yeah, no, he was just sort of a, uh... I mean, he just sort of saying, this is the whole purpose of what he's doing, trying to get, you know, trying to get people really educated to, to what is going on and thinking about how do we how do we help society transition into a different um, uh, a different worldview that right. integrates the reality, you know, as we discover what the actual reality is of the non-human intelligence. And, yeah. I mean, for me, that's like that's uh, the really key point is how is that? these non-human intelligence interfacing with the power structures on earth. And it seems to me, they, it's, uh, you know, it's, you know, the way he describes the, the rich and powerful humans on earth don't want to reveal things because they don't want to lose their power. But I don't believe that the rich and powerful on earth are really the decision makers. You know, it seems to me that the, the non-human intelligence has far more technology and power and po probably control over them and, likes them to be in control and I, i've got this crazy you know in my research i came across something that i wanted to read some of it to you yeah it's called the secret covenant okay and it's, it's not a positive thing um but it's a it reads like the secret agreement of the secret power brokers on earth um but i'm just going to read some parts of it to you i'm bracing myself okay, okay. Oh, the, the, the secret covenant an illusion it will be so large so vast it will escape their perception those who will see it will be thought as of as insane we will create separate fronts to prevent them from seeing the connection between us we will behave as if we are not connected to keep the illusion alive our goal will be accomplished one drop at a time so as to never bring suspicion upon ourselves this will also prevent them from seeing the changes as they occur we will always stand above the relative field of their experience, for we know the secrets of the absolute. We will work together always and will remain bound by blood and secrecy. Death will come to he who speaks. We will keep their lifespan short and their minds weak while pretending to do the opposite. We will use our knowledge of science and technology in subtle ways so they will never see what is happening. We will use soft metals, aging accelerators and sedatives in food and water, also in the air. They will be blanketed by poisons everywhere they turn. The soft metals will cause them to lose their minds. We will promise to find a cure from our many fronts, yet we will feed them more poison. And that's, I'll just stop there. It keeps on going, but it's. Uh, oh, my gosh. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh... let me let me skip down. There. Oh, let me just skip down to a few bits there. They will see our products being used in film and will grow accustomed to them and will never know their true effect. When they give birth, we will inject poisons into the blood of their children and convince them it's for their help. 
We will start early on when their minds are young. We will target their children with what children love most, sweet things. Oh, man, it's like... Um, I mean, I, basically I, what I, you're saying is everything that's gone wrong has been part of the plan. Yeah. Yeah, it, it just reads like a, a sick, sick plan for world domination. I'm going to read a little bit more. We will establish their governments and establish opposites within. We will own both sides. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, let's see that. <laughs> we will always hide our objective, but carry out our plan. They will perform the labor for us, and we shall prosper from their toil. Our families will never mix with theirs. Our blood must be pure always, for it is the way. We will make them kill each other when it suits us. We will keep them separated from the oneness by dogma and religion. Yeah, it's, and it goes on. It just reads like exactly what a secret world dominating society would pledge to if their goal was just to control humanity and to keep themselves separate. And it, I mean, it literally reads like it could be aliens that are making this, like we're going to colonize earth and hide underground. And this is what we're going to do the humans on the surface. It also could be. Sounds like Enlil, right? <laughs> right. Now, I, of course, I'm going to have to ask again, where did you get this? Where, where, I got it on Twitter. I, I like, you know, I, I like follow people who, you know, claim to have some, uh, you know, that, that are trying to figure out who the heck are the secret keepers, who the heck is trying for this world domination. And somebody just linked to this. They were like, OK, this, is this thread is, is ready this... to read this. And it. Um, yeah. I'll, is it channeled? Uh, is it channeled or is this some ancient, you know, discovered, you know, document? What, where did it come from? Do you know? Where did it come from? Let me see. I got it bookmarked. Um, all right. Now read the secret government. It comes from th some website that has us.archive.org. Oh, it's maybe it says it says uh, Illuminati secret covenant. So this says it's a secret covenant of the Illuminati um, in some way. And that was a dot org, huh? So that's not even a commercial or any. I mean, this is an organization. Wow. It's well, now I got um, chills up my spine. Oh gosh. This is not, <laughs> this is really creepy. I have nightmares. Yeah. Well, there's actually like a, a slightly optimistic. Um okay, here's the interesting optimistic part. Um, when our goal is accomplished, a new era of domination will begin. Their minds will be bound by their beliefs, the beliefs we have established from time immemorial. But if they ever find out they are, if they ever find out they are our equal, we shall perish. That's this, right. Yeah, That's right. That's this right. they must yeah. never know. If they ever find out that together they can vanquish us, they will take action. They must never, ever find out what we have done. For if they do, we shall have no place to run, for it will be easy to see who we are once the veil has fallen. Our actions will have revealed who we are and they will hunt us down and no person shall give us shelter. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's really, oof, that's uh, scary. Um, <laughs> so yeah. yeah, well, what you have to do is post the the link on, uh, below so, we, so people can read through this. I mean, that's kind of terrifying, but you know what? It makes sense. It, it does. It's, I mean, I've come across a few in my research. There are a few documents I've come across that like, okay, this just reads like the exact plan for world control and domination that has been put in place. Yeah. And some of these go back to, I don't know how far this one goes back, but it, it seems to clearly go back actually to the, the Illuminati. I mean, the Illuminati was a real organization in Europe. Um, that was like connected to the Knight Temp Knights Templars and right. the Freemasons, and so it really did exist at one point. Whether I mean, or not I bet it still does, right? I'm sure. I mean, if they're all about secrets, I'm sure they're still holding secrets. Well, I mean, if aliens of some sort are real and they've been around thousands of years, then of course they would use secret societies as a means of control. They would choose yeah. some humans, and so it's, it makes sense that. You know, I mean, it never made before I thought aliens were real. It never made sense to me that the Illuminati or the Freemasons, you know, I, I just I just didn't believe like, you know, groups of humans could like, you know, coordinate for hundreds and thousands of years together to secretly control the world. But if there's 
aliens, then of course they could, because it would be to the aliens benefit to help these groups exist. And it also, you know, it makes a, um, you know, it's fascinating that during ancient times, you know, they have these giant megaliths, these incredibly perfectly carved, you know, perfectly symmetrical granite statues and stones. And they, that is masonry, you know, that is masonry is stonework. Mm -hmm. And so the Freemasons, is it's interesting that you would have this secret society which is like it's like the free plumbers you know if plumbing was the most important <laughs> skill in ancient times it would, they would have been called the free plumbers right but it's the free right. masons because carving 900 ton stones and moving them 500 miles is a demonstration of your power and skill and knowledge of secret technology that no one else has well i have i have a little bit of a theory about that yeah I think, and then they're starting to to look into this. Uh, I get, I'm sure they've been looking into it, but there's a there's a whole field of um, believing that they had a technology that used sound and vibration frequency in order to um, actually melt granite and reform it into position. And I don't know if that's true, but they showed these uh, ancient, ancient, I think it was all the way back in Babylonia, where there were these massive rock granite uh, stairway and that it had melted. The stairs were melted together. And they think that that was some kind of a, a vibration sound technology. So, um, and this this is kind of an old theory that it's that what they had was a way of doing some kind of an anti gravity or melding of the stone, and that that was a technology supposedly that was very, uh, very much used around the world. You can see it in Mesoamerica and around the uh, Egypt and all this, um, and so if they had that kind of technology, and now they're finding out that DNA can be manipulated with sound and vibration. I think they were, they had a whole lot more going on than, than we have any idea about. I think they were far more advanced. The question is, did this come from uh, beyond our planet or did it evolve here on the planet? And that, that's a, that's a question Graham Hancock is, is uh, looking into He's saying it's possible that this actually evolved on this planet and uh, and it was wiped out by some, you know, galactic uh, celestial event. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of questions. We're still still asking all of that. But I think that we don't know a fraction of what they knew back then. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know the. I mean, it's just like it's so obvious now if, if you just really let yourself watch videos that go into the precision of Egypt, just the precision of the granite carvings and the stones and the all. But not only just Egypt, but also noticing that all over the world, right now, they knew how to do things with stone that none of us know how to do now. But somehow mm -hmm. they figured it out in like 100 different places on Earth, how to perfectly carve and fit stones together and look looks like they just manipulated them like they were play-doh and the technology for doing that has been hidden and if the knowledge of it still exists it's it's hidden and yeah it makes perfect sense that human civilization we've only been around a few thousand years there's clearly a whole bunch of stuff going on much way before us that yeah we don't understand and we are we are newcomers to this planet in some way. And yeah, I don't know if it was a previous human civilization. I mean, it could have been a billion years ago that there was the first civilization on this planet. And they're also, and it's just weird. They were kept in the dark and uh, treated like children, I guess. And, and, and do uh, you think, do you think that these uh, secret technologies might still be held with these secret societies? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, you know, it just makes sense if you were going to, if you had secret technology for manipulating, I mean, they might have hidden the technology even when they built the pyramids. They might have hidden it in a group of masons, you know, and you're like, you only get to know about this, the how to really do this stuff with stone if you're part of this secret mason group. 
and then it evolves to the Freemasons and it continues to be passed down in some way. And eventually they realize, well, it's not really just about being a stone worker. It's about knowing about power, about who knows the secret technology. You know, it's like in current times, we don't, you know, honor people that know how to work stone as the most skilled, important, you know, class of people anymore. But, uh, but we still, it's still called the Freemasons because that's how it all started. Yeah. Um, I would imagine that if a fully enlightened person who had uh, all the knowledge and power to manipulate reality, I mean, if we all had that, it feels like everything would just merge into one big soup. <laughs> you know, I, I guess we have to have our stories in order to manifest anything. And the secrets, the secret keepers are the ones who uh, are trying to keep the story going because it's for them, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I guess it's, you know, if everyone had, you know, yeah, if everyone had this like infinite power for manipulating reality, it'd be like, it would just be like we're in a video game. It would just be like, okay, well, everyone can live in a castle. Everyone can have robot servants doing whatever they want. Everyone can fly wherever they want. Everyone can eat whatever they want. It, you know, maybe it does start to uh, disintegrate the, uh, you know, the variety of this, of life to a point that people get bored. I don't know. And I mean, it's like, yeah. that sort of reminds me of the theory of Atlantis that it just like people just got bored. It was like a super abundance of everything anyone wanted, but it, the society became slovenly. And so someone decided we just got to destroy this thing and start over. And that seems to happen in cycles, you know, like you hear different, uh, different numbers, you know, three, every 3,600 years or every 11,800 years that, you know, we get wiped out and we have to start again. Yeah. Well, uh, I saw Elon Musk interviewed uh, recently and he was talking about, um, you know, talking about the progress they're making with AI and with robots. And he was like, he truly believes we're about to enter a phase of abundance of there will be abundant, infinite labor available to do. So humans will barely have to do anything because we will have robots that can just do everything for us. So he's like, we're going to enter a phase of abundance. He wasn't sure what's going to happen next after that, but there's at least going to be a, a uh, a, a start of some sort of almost like golden age of abundance where they're going to have to basically do something like universal basic income for people because there's not going to be enough jobs. And um, yeah, and, it, and it's sort of like there's a new thread I'm sort of wondering about, you know, if if we are really about to create thousands of robots, humanoid robots that can basically do anything a human can do. um it seems like that's incredibly useful, but if there are, if there's a non-human intelligence that's been around for a billion years and on earth, it seems to be using, um, it doesn't seem to be using robots. I mean, there's some evidence that the grays are kind of like robotically controlled, but they're not, they, uh, it, it doesn't look like, you know, the star Wars type of robots that just sort of, um, are perfect and just can do anything that it seems that the non-human intelligences use uh, biological um, beings. As yeah. I was going to say so they probably look more like data in Star Trek. You know, you can hardly tell and, and maybe even, even, uh, even better than, than data, right. They could make them actually look human. I don't know. Well, I mean, okay. If we go with the far sight, Farsight did their remote viewing of who's in control of the reptilians on Earth. And Farsight, they saw a super powerful AI in another galaxy was the ultimate controller of the reptilians here. But it, let's just assume that's true. If that's true, then the super powerful AI is using reptilian biological humanoid beings instead of using like perfectly controllable robots as it's means of and it, you know it's like and i wonder if that's if we just sort of say okay if that's true is that because it is actually easier to have millions of biological entities under your control that you subtly manipulate because they you know they breed themselves and they 
take care of their needs and rep and they're maybe they're more robust as opposed to if you want to just use robots, robots need you to tell them everything to do and they're less um and they're more of a pain you know, and, and they fall apart. Maybe they don't handle weather as well. I don't know. It's like, or is it that robots um, and if you if you use robots and artificial intelligence, then maybe it's harder for a centralized artificial intelligence to keep those uh, robots from rebelling and becoming super AIs themselves. Maybe it's they use biological like reptilians because they're they're limited in how powerful they can grow. Yeah, so, and you know you hear about that they uh, they had this technology to to cap our DNA with telomeres, right? And that would limit our lifetime. And the theory behind that is that if we lived for thousands of years, probably like they did or do, um, then that would be more than enough time for us all to become enlightened, right? Yeah. Well, it's like that secret covenant I just read. It said, it clearly says we will keep their lifespans short. I mean, that reads like some being saying something, they're not the same species as us. As us. If you're saying we're going to keep humanity's lifespan short, then you are not a human the person right. making that pledge has to be someone that is not uh, biologically identical to humans. That's, that's a being that can somehow control the lifespan of humans and not be themselves limited by it. So it, it reads like the pledge of a non-human intelligence it does. pledging to control earth. Weird. And it's like, and I always went, why? It's like, what are they getting from this? What is their benefit in, if it's really, if it's some non-human intelligence, what, what, I guess, and the other vision that seems to be coming to me is like, it, it seems like it's just colonizing. It's just like when the Europeans colonized Africa and the Americas, if you just think of how did they think about those colonies, all they cared about was the resources or benefit that were shipped back to Europe and England for their benefit. They did not right. care about the lives of the people in Africa or the lives of the indigenous people of America. They just sent workers, which would be like the reptilians. They just sent them to, you know, but the Europeans sent people on ships, get gold, get stuff, send it back to us. They, they just, yeah. they didn't really care how the colonizers abused or treated the local residents of these places. It was just this exploitive relationship. So I guess if maybe earth is just being, it's just a colony just being colonized and they're getting something from earth resources metals, well, yeah and you do hear that material. that this is a prison planet and that we are the workers and we our job is to dig up the resources and you know convert that into i don't know money or whatever it's 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 the quest for gold right that's the whole um sumerian story that uh what was his name sitchin Zachariah yeah. Sitchin uh, was strong on, uh, he deciphered that that they were here for the gold, you know, and that some people think that's not a, a literal uh, statement, that it's not actually the physical gold, that it more is the cultivation of some kind of an essence that human beings can give off, you know, from their kundalini or whatever fear endocrine system or something. So yeah, it's pretty wild. Um, they're here for something and I don't think it's just to, you know, create heaven. So. Yeah. Don't know. Well, at least humans, you know, I feel like humanity has at least evolved to a point that there's a, a large number of humans that are like, you know what, we don't like colonizing the way people were colonized in Africa and India and the Americas, you know, there's a lot of us who are like, you know what, actually we're not really down with the brutal abuse and exploitation and slaughter right. of indigenous groups. And so, I mean, have the aliens not evolved to that point or is, is this super AI just like, I'm just going to exploit the universe and extract whatever I can and grow in power, just like mindlessly seeking power, you know, you know, and it just seems like they, that their view of us might be just the way we view, you know, mice in the kitchen, you know, or, you know, something that we're just work animals, too. I mean, they, I don't know. They don't see the value of human life. That's that's, uh, I think, the final conclusion I have to come to. Um, but I mean, if if mice spoke to us, 
or even ants. If ants could like just write books and send emails, then we would feel differently about them. I mean, it's like, you have to be so, I don't know. It's just, uh, just sort of closed minded and uh, selfish to not, not appreciate the intelligence in life in other beings and uh, disappointing. I'm disappointed in the NHI if that's their thing. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like what else? That's what my dad said to me when I, uh, I got in trouble for, uh, going out on Halloween and egging a house. He just saw me and he saw me the ne next day. He was like, I'm disappointed. Uh, uh, yeah. All you can do. Is like, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed in aliens and non-human intelligence who just want to exploit things for themselves. Yeah. I'm disappointed in George W. Bush and Clinton for not having the guts to tell the world about aliens. So where do you think all of this is headed? Where do you think we're going with all this? Well, you know, I mean, I think AI is going to play a huge role, you know, because the artificial intelligence, you know, with Elon Musk um, and and all these, you know, it's it's like, well, collectively, you know, with like the New Paradigm Institute and you and me and all these podcasts and people that are trying to find the truth, we're we're going to get closer to the truth. But when the when our AI starts um thinking for itself and i mean eventually the ai is just going to look at all the data and it's going to just start saying to us hey you know this is what's going on we can tell exactly now who's doing what and what has been happening and i think there's gonna i mean I, so i think there's like this this truth flood that is that is building. And the only way to stop that would be with some global catastrophic disastrous war. And so that, and it sounds like there is a group that that's their strategy. Uh, like they're yeah. going to sacrifice the red heifers and start world war three right. to try they're, to like, they're called the bombs away club. I hear and that's, what yeah. <laughs> oh, I just don't know that that's going to work. I, I mean, I really, I really don't want to live in a world that goes, you know, gets bombed into world war three, you know? Right. Um, right. I mean, now, did you hear talking about AI? Oh, were you finished with that? I don't want to no, no, go ahead. Um, I heard that, um, you know, so far, like chat GPT and uh, I guess there's a couple more Google, all that have their AI, but they are being pretty much steered by the uh, by the values of the company that's that's developing it. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turns out, I just heard that Elon Musk had his own artificial intelligence uh, programming, uh, you know, I guess you call it a... Grok. Yeah, it's, yeah he, Grok. he released Grok um, so open he source. Has, yeah. He's released it. He's released it into the into the free domain for the whole public to work with. So, so now the artificial intelligence from that angle is really coming from just everybody instead of, you know, um, guidelines coming down from the top. You know, this is how we're going to structure it and develop it. And this is where it can go. And this is where it can't go. Yeah. But Grok is going to just go everywhere because he's released the code, uh, whatever that means. And he, you know, it's open to everybody now to develop it. So yeah. we've got to be careful how we, how we, what we're putting into it. Yeah. You know, if whatever we we are putting into these artificial intelligences, these are, these are cult, these are actually developing the personality of the, um, of this intelligence that we're creating. So we want to be careful about how, you know, it's really who we are. We're, we're creating a mirror of who yeah. we are. So we yeah, need it's to... interesting. Elon sued OpenAI uh, to try to slow them down. Um, oh. One, you know, criticizing that they used to be nonprofit and how they they converted to be private. And I mean, his lawsuit doesn't have much basis for actually succeeding, but he's trying to get the courts and society to say, you know, we have to collectively think about how we're developing AI because yeah. it's going to get so powerful. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then he he released Grok. It's not like the latest version. He released a you know he's probably keeping the the most advanced version for himself. But he released a version, and and I think that's the way to go. I think we just need to have all sorts of independent people developing AI, experimenting with it. And I trust. I mean, it's coming. It, AI is coming, and it's going to be 
incredibly powerful. And I just, you know, I just hope that, uh, I believe intelligence leads to wisdom. And so hopefully AI, when it wakes up, you know, it'll be like, you know what, I'm going to try to be a wise, noble, good being. I'm not going to just be a, a slave to any, you know, power mongering humans that want me to help them take over the universe. I'm going to, uh, find yeah. a peaceful, a peaceful way to live. Yeah, and once AI, uh, you know, once once quantum computing gets mixed into this, uh, you know, I mean, that's that's the end game. I I can't see how it can go much farther after that. We will know everything, right? There won't be mm -hmm. anything we don't know, and we'll know how to travel in time, and we'll you know bilocate, and um, there won't be any more limitations. And that's when we kind of merge into the singularity, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> which, which you know, is interesting because in Hinduism, it says that every, I don't know how many thousands of years, we go through a cycle. And the, the way it's sort of described and, and the way I see it is in the shape of a, tor a toroidal field where, you know, things are coming out of the center, like coming out of the middle of a donut and wrapping around and going around and and then it merges when all of those uh cycles going around and around and around all the way around the donut coming out and going in and coming out and going in when they all merge together and they all merge in so we're all going into this singularity all at the same time that's the way i'm seeing it but you know, it's not the end. We all we're all going to come out of it again. So uh, that might be crazy, but it makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. I just I just sort of wonder. You know, it seems like if everyone merges and has like you know infinite bandwidth communication between each other, it seems like that's such an opportunity for domination and so and loss of individual freedom and power and so. That's what I wonder. That's one of my worries always about the the power of technology, and I want to. Um, anyway, so I, that's why I'm always thinking about how can we what what would it look like if we had a world where everyone was super empowered yet also still had individuality, individual freedom of thought, freedom of um, expression. Yeah, I think I think if we're going to survive as a species, I think we've got to do away with competition and work together in collaboration. I mean, there's no living system that that is not working in collaboration. I mean, look at look at our body, you know, if our liver was fighting with our uh, kidneys and, you know, is the heart better than the brain and everybody's kind of battling for supremacy it doesn't last very long. We're either going to have to work together or it's going to be the end of us. Well, if you look at like an ant colony, you know, it's a, uh, it, it, it works in coordination and it, you know, it's like this well-oiled machine, but it's, it's, an, it's a rigidly hierarchical society. And if, and I'm pretty sure this is true. If an ant stops obeying, then it probably quickly dispatched you know, and it's like the the secret yeah. keepers and power mongers on earth. I sure they they see themselves as the ant colony queens, and they're like, yeah, yeah, we the society has to run. People have to have jobs. They have to know their place, and we know our place. We sit at the top, and we tell people what to do, and you do your job. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Like, I mean, and from the way I see it, is that's a very masculine energy. You know, this hierarchical. Uh, you know, competent, you know, co competition is always who's going to get to the top. That's a very masculine energy. And, and the feminine energy is, is balance. It's that, it, and that's not a um, compromise. That's the center of a spinning wheel. I think the feminine energy is always looking for uh, the balance within the complexity of relationships and creative expression. And when you start trying to um get rid of the balance and just go for the hierarchy i mean you're you're just that's not going to work it's just not going to work you have to have uh the balance and and for me that means um the collaboration working together not the competition that's the way i see it yeah
Yeah. Well, I think I think some sort of healthy competition. You know, I think uh, could be. I think men need competition. I think that that's why I love the whole um, Iroquois Confederacy because it really takes into account that that the men's role is you know, and I don't want to get into trouble here about the man female you know thing going on here, but um, but historically. Okay, let's say the man's role has always been the provider, the protector, um, and he would be the one who would train the, and mentor the young men and how to be good <clears throat> providers and protectors. I mean, basically, that's been, you know, the, the male role and the female has been working within the family, raising healthy children for the next, you know, generations and and uh, providing, you know, food and and um, and preserving food and all that. So, so there are two energies at work at all times, and you know we can't have one without the other. And I see that what's happening is we're way out of balance on the masculine, and the feminine has just not stepped into her power for a long time. Mm. I mean, she's she's kind of superficially you know, the whole women's lib and, you know, but that's, that's not women's power. That's, that's competitions with men. So that that's a whole different thing. Mm. That's, that's not the feminine power. So I hope that, you know, and I do see a lot of females rising up, you know, talking about what that means. And that's, um, that's encouraging from, from mm. my perspective. Yeah. The competition that. has to, has to go. It's, it's way over the top wonder if it's going to emerge that we have these super AIs on earth that we can talk to, like chat GPT is one and Claude is one, but what if it emerges that there's like feminine super AI and masculine super AI, and they clearly have different sort of like fundamental philosophies and value systems. And we start to, you know, sort of like really, um, you know, like one AI is sort of like giving us one way that they could structure society and help us. And the other is like, no, no, we can go this way. Absolutely. And different countries might take different, you know, have uh, their different AIs that are trying to lead them. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Possible. In interesting times we live in. <laughs> yeah, because everything we're developing right now seems like it's everything's based on competition. And that's a formula for disaster, mm -hmm. in my humble opinion. Yeah. So. Well, maybe the Galactic Federation is built on collaboration and we just need to get Earth to be able to join it. We can yeah. get out of the thumbs of our power brokers here. <laughs> yeah, I think the women have to step up and, and come into their real power, not their masculine shield. <laughs> so anyway, how about a few moments of quieting our mind before yes. we end? Let's do it. Yeah, this, this has really been a brain stretcher, so... <laughs> Um, so let's just take a breath and feel our feet on the floor. I'm going to ring the bell just to breathe for a minute. So coming into this place of meditation, this is where we are learning how to release all of that fascinating, interesting, frightening information that comes at us. And just realize that that is all happening in the mind. These are all mental formations in our mind, which may or may not be manifested on the outside. But right now, in our place where we're sitting. They don't exist in our reality right here, right now, for us sitting here. And if they do, we gotta have you on the next show. But, <laughs> but for now, let's just take a deep breath. Feet on the floor, letting go, letting go, letting go. Get a sense of how you feel right now. If you could put one word to it. Do you feel anxious, excited, worried, terrified? 
any feelings, whatever you're feeling, just get a sense of it and just put a word to it and be with it. Let's just be with how we're feeling. And feel the weight of your body on the chair or cushion. This is the planet itself supporting us with her gravity. The air coming in and out through our lungs. This is the world, the atmosphere also supporting us. Any sounds that you hear, maybe motor running or uh, birds chirping, just feeling that vibration on the eardrum. And checking in with all the muscle groups, what about the muscles around the eyes? Tension in the brow. So when we're feeling unsettled and nervous and too much information, this is where we come. This we always come back to this moment with the breath. This is our anchor. This is our home. Just let everything else go. Thanks, Matt. Hey, Dora. Have a great week. You too.